Good morning. My name is Tim Gritton, and I'm the uh, new Associate Dean for Libraries, and I'd like to welcome you to the Bernath Auditorium of the David Adamini uh, Undergraduate Library. Um, I came here six months ago because, really, of all of the cool things that were going on in the library and the sort of the innovative spirit that I could sense within, um, within all the, the libraries here on campus. And a few months after I arrived, um, Keith Whitfield noticed the same spirit across all of campus, that same sort of energy, that same sort of desire to, to try new things. Um, and so he came from Duke University, and I have the privilege to introduce uh, Keith Whitfield, who is our chief academic officer, the uh, number two executive to Pro uh, President Wilson. Um, Keith is a, a neurologist with an expert, who is an expert in aging in African-American po uh, populations. He is a prolific author who has written 180 uh, articles, books, book reports, or book reports, uh, book chapters. <laughs> Have you written a few book reports? <laughs> Very prolific. Uh, um, and in any case, he's, he is here to talk about uh, academic quality and really to engage with you and, and hear from you and get uh, questions and, and find out what you're, you're looking for as we go forward at Wayne State. So with that, Keith Woodfield. Well, good morning. That's one of the better good mornings I've heard since I've been here. You know, in the South, you're used to, you know, the minister says good morning, choir, and everybody yells, you know, rambunctiously. And usually I say good morning, people say good morning. So I'm glad you're here with me. I feel like we're connecting. Uh, I gotta tell you, I'm like sweating bullets. I'm so nervous to be up here. We expected like there to be 10 people, uh, but, uh, it is fantastic, I think, the turnout that we've had. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, I know that there's never really a good time to have a university-wide meeting, and so I appreciate you making time in your busy day. Uh, I've been coming to Wayne State, uh, kind of mentioned there, I'm not a neurologist. I feel like that might have been a bit of a promotion. I'm, I'm a psychologist who works on cognitive aging. Um, but I've been coming to Wayne State for about 20 years as a member of the advisory committee of the Institute for Gerontology here. So I'm a long-term fan of this institution. But when I accepted the position as provost, I instantly felt like I didn't really know enough about Wayne State. And you can search the web all you want, you can learn little pieces and parts, but you still don't get the same feeling as when you're here. Um, I have been uh, asked about how it's like getting to know the university, um, and I have never understood better the old adage of drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm drinking as much as gagging about all of the things that I'm learning about this incredible institution. So in an effort to learn more about our institution, and for you to learn a bit more about me, I decided to hold this town hall meeting. I know that sometimes people in administration can seem like they're from Mars, and faculty and staff are from Venus. But we share common goals, but sometimes different perspectives on how to achieve those goals. One of my ultimate goals as your provost is to try to be able to, <laughs> that I'm learning more and more about what words really mean, consensus. Trying to get consensus across the incredible university we have, 1,700 faculty, our 27,000 plus students, it's difficult but it's something that we're going to be striving for out of the provost office. The ultimate goal today is to have a public conversation about matters of importance to our university. If it goes well, perhaps we should have another. <laughs> but like first dates, let's just see how this one goes. <laughs> so our topic is academic quality. And to some degree, I think I wanted to try to dispel um, confusion, myths, assumptions that because I'm coming from Duke University, which if you use the right ranking system is a top 10 institution, that somehow I don't understand our institution. And um, I would make an effort to try to correct people who might think that from letting them understand that, you know, my 
pedigree is not one of an Ivy League or an Ivy Plus school. That I went to the College of Santa Fe. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah, very few because it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it has changed its name. And Texas Tech University, as somebody was jokingly was saying, I was from Texas A&M. And if you're from Texas, that's like you know a slap in the face. Um, I've been in institutions like this institution. And I think more importantly, I was a student like many of the students that we have here. So I identify with them in many ways. And one of the reasons why I took this job was that it was because of a transformational set of experiences that I had as an undergraduate that took somebody who was an average at best student, did not do well at math, um, did not write very well. Oh, my doctoral dissertation, I still thank him to this day. Um, but I developed as an individual, and it started from having a great undergraduate experience and a great graduate experience. So I keep saying the word great. Great universities are typically described as having great faculty, great students, great staff, great research infrastructure, great academic programs, and of course, great sports teams. You should be clapping, you know, because our football team is doing well. Woo! Somebody was joking with me and saying, you know, oh, well, you're from Duke, you know, you must be used to, you know, only okay football teams. Our Duke football team has gone to bowls like four years in a row, but they were at a place maybe 10 years ago where they weren't batting 500. So we have to keep our spirit and our thoughts positive towards our football team. So as we think about quality, as we think about excellence, um, what I've known in every case as we think about excellence is that it's an aspiration that is continually pursued, <coughs> often claimed, but maybe seldom attained. The hunger for doing better can sometimes be suppressed with the enormous challenges that we face as institutions of higher education. Sometimes it's helpful to get outs an outside perspective, bring somebody in new to help guide, encourage, and support institutions to renew that hunger for excellence. I think that that's what happened when this university so wisely selected Roy Wilson to be their president. And I think that he continued that thrust with the new appointments that he made in his leadership team. And I think that that was his intention when he picked me to come serve as your provost. So I've been here for four months. I used to have a little calendar where I marked off the days because I wanted to get to 90 days. <laughs> and uh, as people on the policy committee will jokingly say, you know, if you make it that long, you hold some record. I hear that we've had lots of provosts in the past. <laughs> So over these last four months, I've begun learning about the great things that happen at Wayne State. I'm well aware I don't know everything about the university, but I want to thank the faculty and staff that have been tutoring me on, especially for my book reports, um, <laughs> on what's been going on now and some of the history um, that, that we have and how we got to where we are. I also want to give a very, very special thanks uh, to the Provost Office staff who almost literally holds my hand and attempts to contribute uh, to, to helping me lead and provide leadership for the Institute. As provost, I work with deans of our 13 colleges and schools. We have excellent deans. Believe me, I have worked with a lot of deans. Um, I know good ones from okay ones. We have excellent deans who truly care deeply about the faculty, the staff, and the students in their colleges and schools. While each one has different needs and perspectives on lots of issues, one thing that we share is that hunger for excellence and a desire to offer quality academic programs. In pursuit of learning about the university, I've been visiting with faculty and staff from the various colleges and schools. I also intend to speak with students to hear about their perspective and the things that are both good and challenging involved in getting a Wayne State education. So I've learned a lot so far. I know there's much more to be learned, but our university is in constant motion, and there's lots of parts to try to monitor. I sometimes think that it's almost like being a linguist, because 
the way that you speak and the things that are important to people in education are different from the things that are important and are a focus for people in pharmacy versus social work. Um, believe it or not, I actually like that, as challenging as it is. Um, it gets you to really understand the strength of the foundation which we stand on as faculty, staff, administrators, and students. I want to talk with you today about at least one of those dimensions of my duties as your provost, and that's fostering and promoting quality in our academic programs. I do this in part by encouraging and empower our faculty to continuously improve the quality of our academic offerings. Now, I start from the assumption that we have really good offerings in most of our degree programs, and some most would even consider great. So then, what's my challenge? My challenge is, how do you make good great, and how do you make great better? When I think about high uh, quality academic programs, I think about at least three different levels. First is the course level, that face-to-face -face combat with students to take them from where they are to where you want them to be. So you have to ask questions, like are the right learning objectives for the class being implemented? Is the right pedagogy being used? I also think about this at the program level. Is the curriculum cohesive? Is there a clear path towards graduating? And are the skills needed for careers in that major being taught? On that last point, I have to ruminate just a little bit because I think we, we often struggle between the idea of being technical, of giving some, you know, you need to learn skill one, two, and three to get a job versus more of maybe a liberal arts education where there are things that just good consumers of, edu of, of knowledge and, and of information actually know how to go about doing those things and so they're more generalized skills. But they're still regardless skills that students need to be competitive in the 21st century. And then the third level that I think of is the college. Are, the, are there complementary degree programs utilizing our talented faculty to teach co courses? I will share with you one of my own perspectives. Um, I was talking about how, which one is it, faculty or from Mars and, I, somebody's from Mars and somebody's from Venus. Um, I still think about myself as a faculty. Actually, I was sharing with Tim that one of the challenges that I have is to at least act like a provost. Because you're not born a provost, you become a provost. So I think a lot like a faculty to this day. And in some ways, I really think about if my course or the courses that I used to teach actually fit in with all of my colleagues' courses. How is that important? How is it the foundation? As I look out across this crowded room, um, it really starts, I feel like I'm supposed to be teaching again. At Duke, I used to teach classes that were 250 or larger, and one time taught a class of 500. And so, this is like the right size for me um, in terms of trying to teach, but I would always think about, and it was an intro class, how did that intro set students up to be able to be prepared to do the major in psychology at Duke University. Um, I think we have to occasionally ask ourselves those kinds of questions at that college level. And then lastly, are the resources being used strategically to make all programs the best that they can be? Academic quality leads to student success. And as you know, as you've heard from our president in his State of the University address, student success is one of our primary foci. Um, a lot of the metrics that we use even for our strategic planning come back to thinking about how we can make our students successful and how they can learn uh, everything that they know to be able to have a lifelong learning trajectory. So student success is one of our primary missions and we should have high quality programs that students should be able to get out in four years. Sometimes we forget that as a goal. Uh, I think that we have adjusted to how some of our students matriculate through our university and that they take a little bit longer, but we still should have the, a design that they should get out in four years. And what they do individually is what we try to help and coax them and encourage them to get out and get done as soon as they can. 
During my time here, I found it fascinating to learn that if you do the difference between a four-year and a six-year degree, for those who you are students in here, the additional costs, the difference in wages, the loans, is about $20,000. So rather than it costing less because you're taking fewer hours, it's, it's actually costing you more in a lot of ways. So keep that in mind. So in pursuit of the quality, improving the quality, we have been doing various things at this university, some of which that I've learned about include, uh, and probably our biggest effort, and that's general education reform. I think it's at the heart of our goal to try to improve quality at the university. Now, changing general education requirements is something that lots and lots of schools have been doing for the last five to seven years. I think that that's just been one of the movements that we see in higher education. From my experience, there's at least four steps. It's like a four-step program to, to changing and, and changing your gym ed. The first step typically starts with a philosophy and approach uh, and to see if there's consensus around this new or changed or modified perspective on what should be that core base of things that every undergraduate needs at this university. Step two is that it then requires an examination of resources that can support the proposed changes. Step three, then design and implement a plan where the fewest faculty and students are adversely impacted. And then step four, you try it out. And then you assess to see whether it's working and where it's not, and you make adjustments. So understand that nothing is going to be perfect. Uh, when you make change, you have to adjust to that change that you've made. And so that's what we have in front of us. Um, I would say that we're still working on step one and trying to develop step two. While I think that we need to get this done in a reasonable amount of time, whatever that is, um, I think that our curricular structure for Gen Ed uh, slows students to, in their progress towards graduation. And so we need to do a thoughtful and careful development of a new curriculum and to do it sooner than later. I hope that each of you chimes in when asked about what is being proposed. Again, that goal for consensus. I have learned that we have some important things in place in the pursuit of quality of academic programs that also include mid-semester assessment programs. I think that that's led by our Office for Teaching and Learning. Um, if you haven't interacted with the Office of Teaching and Learning, pass by, pay attention to the emails and the newsletters that come by. As you walked in today, you saw some of, uh, is Matt here? That was for which program? That was for Warrior Teaching Days. For Warrior Teaching Days. Um, I don't know, I've walked by it a couple of times now, and each time I try to take in a little bit something more about seeing the value in those interactions that you see between faculty and students. Um, those are the things that bring quality. It's just a different and tangible sort of dimension that comes towards having high, a high quality program here at Wayne. Another ongoing um, activity, uh, particularly as we prepare for uh, the HLC visit that will come in March, is program assessment. Now, in my former position, um, I was primarily responsible for assessment at Duke University. Some might think that um, because it's ranked as a top 10 institution, that wasn't an issue. It was a huge issue. No one wanted to do it. People thought that it was bureaucratic, that it didn't have any value. Some of the same things some of your colleagues say today. <laughs> um, let me share with you my perspective on program assessment. We don't do it for the bureaucracy. That is what is an outside force that, that actually influences us. We have to have our own goals, our own ideas, and our own objectives towards program assessment. We have to do things, these things for the sake of making sure that we keep our eye towards quality. That's the process that keeps us uh, moving towards quality. Maybe that never necessarily attaining it, but always in pursuit of it. So we do it to develop the best course, the best program, the best curricular pathway. 
We want to identify what students are getting out of what, uh, what you want them to learn. And we need to figure out new pedagogies that work and which ones don't work. Now remember, and this is uh, the piece that I share with Kathy Barrett on a daily basis, because different people, even in that general realm of program uh, assessment, have different perspectives. Mine is, is that it doesn't need to be fancy. It needs to be an effort. It needs to be a goal. It needs to be something that you're working towards. And what I typically have found is that if you just start, you'll start asking yourself questions, because that's, for those of you who are faculty, that's kind of what all of us have done through our dissertations, through our advanced degrees, we ask questions. And this is an, a question, asking a question of yourself, of what am I doing right? Maybe even, what am I doing wrong? Like, none of you are doing anything wrong. You should maybe just say what you're doing right. But to try to make sure that those are the things that are the best things for the student, that they're getting the most out of it, and where you might be able to improve. I also want to say as provost, I want to be able to celebrate the successes in offering academic quality at, the, in, at Wayne State. Uh, of course, promotion and tenure is one piece of that. But we've also been having some great conversations about offering an innovation and teaching award. Now, I will say that um, I'm a been and actually am a funded researcher, um, even would be classified, I guess, as a STEM researcher. Uh, so those are things throughout my career that have been of primary importance. But what is of equal importance, it doesn't come out in our tenure evaluations, but it is of importance, is how well we're teaching. And we need to make sure that we take the opportunity to celebrate those of us who are really doing a good job in that and encourage others to try to, check, to strive for that excellence. So these are some of my thoughts about how we pursue quality of our academic programs. And I think now what I'd like to do is to hear uh, some of your thoughts. Uh, and it doesn't have to be constrained to these things, but just to start us off, the idea about general education reform, yes, I dare to ask you about what you think. Um, I also want to know how you think we can improve the quality of academic programs uh, at our university. And then thirdly, uh, what resources are needed to continuously improve those academic offerings. So with that, I'd love to hear from anybody in the audience. You know what's fascinating is that, you know, as a professor in particular, and of a professor in large classes, you have to get used to the uncomfortable silence. <laughs> you ask a question and nobody raises their hand, but eventually, it's like if you wait long enough, if you look at a few people, <laughs> they start to get nervous and somebody says, well, I better ask a question. Somebody ever asked a question. See, it happened, thank you. Yes. Um, <coughs> struck me about it. First off, that I only know like four buildings. Um, <laughs> although I get run around a lot, um, I have student workers that always usually are walking me to places so I don't get lost. It's always in danger of losing your provost. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's a couple of impressions I have. One is, is that we don't always know how great the unit right next to us actually is. Mm. We have a problem, and this is, I think it's a problem in the 21st century, in the, in the modern world, in the technology information world, of that, think of how many emails that you get. I actually still have my Duke email address, and I just checked it, I hadn't checked it for two weeks, I have 1,052 emails, most of which is junk. So what will I do? I will push select all, and then I'll maybe go and see if there's a couple for me to choose from, but then I'll get tired and I'll just delete all of them. And I think that that almost is what happens, so sometimes we don't even hear when we actually do actively try to advertise and share the things going on. I would love to see if we could find a better way for us to kind of appreciate each other a little bit more. To understand that there are, I mean, it's, it's great. I have a great job. I actually get to see all the great things going on. Actually, when you're the new provost, everybody wants to brag to you how all the great things that are going on. So I know lots of those. But I'm surprised that I find that faculty all the time don't necessarily know what's going on. One of the other observations that I have is that, like most universities, 
we tend to have a siloing effect. Uh, it happens over time, and usually what you do is you bring in some wild-eyed wild provost to try to break up those silos so that we can get interdisciplinarity working. One of the challenges that we face as a public institution is the limited resources that are shared to us by the state. Um, somebody gave me the estimate that 20 years ago, we used to, like for students, the support was about two-thirds from the state and one-third from the university, and now it's exactly the opposite. So we have to make changes. We actually have to do business a little bit differently. And one of them is, is that we make more with less. Now, I'm an administrator. That's, of course, what I'm supposed to say, because I have to say no to everything you ask for. Um, but there's actually great value in this. Uh, I shared with uh, a group yesterday uh, uh, an example that I really thought was an interesting way to come out of the downturn in 2008. Some colleagues of mine at the University of Washington um, I knew the provost there at the time, and we were talking, and she said, you know, the most amazing thing happened, she goes, and I can't even take credit for it, but because we weren't being as successful at NIH funding, we weren't getting money from the state, rather than everybody hunkering down and making sure that they reserve things, there was much more sharing between some of our entities, between our centers and institutes, between our departments. Um, there were just lots of different ways, and I could give you a a hundred different ways in which they were talking about the things that they had changed. But that philosophy about trying to say, it's not a time for us to hunker down and try to separate ourselves, it's for us to better work together than we have. On the back side of that, what we get is a better university. And so that's one of the things that I've observed that we need to change about some of the culture here. Um, one of the other interesting things is that um, in terms of <coughs> student success, uh, I, I guess this is an observation and a big hope. Um, I think we're on the uphill swing. Um, it's, you can look at it as being temporary, but I just think when I look at the programs that we have in place, when I look at how we're actually identifying students that need help, um, we're doing the right things that are going to actually get us to where we want to be in 2021, which is 50% graduation rate. Um, I have noticed that we have a big difference in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of race and student success, which is something that I have been looking at, actually, I think, I saw Mark Jackson here. There he is, yeah, he's raising his, how reluctantly he's raising his hand. Um, he is doing, you know, he's, like he's doing God's work. He, he's doing this incredible work um, as a group, but one-on-one -on -one with students and really talking to them about the ways in which they need to be successful. And I, if, I think if we can do that a little bit more to scale. One of the other things for students, and I'm so psyched to see students here. Do you all have a book report that you have to do or something? Because <laughs> they're so share with me, you know, take a PDF or something. I have book reports to share. Um, one of the things that has to happen on our campus is that um, become a little less thinking that we are a commuter campus. We're not as much of a commuter campus as people think. Again, I'm new, so I drive around, and when I'm seeing all of the student housing that basically flanks us, we have a huge student population that is really right in the area. From what I've heard that's been changing is, is that even on the weekends now, we actually have more students. We're growing a culture that is an on-campus culture. Part of that helps student success in terms of you all having other people to connect with. You should not be a person of one, okay? You should not be a student of one. You should be a student of many. Because what you do is you learn from others. I used to have friends, some of them, they, I used to have to just study, study, study just to pull a B. It was like, you know, I would just celebrate. And then I have friends where I knew they studied the morning before. And I could never figure out what they did and what I was doing differently. But we found ways to interact. I learned a few little, you know, <laughs> shortcuts. Um, but having that, too, is support. Um, I started off actually one of the transformational things that I talked about was uh, being a minority biomedical research student. And having been in a cohort and having had other people that were going through some of the things, same things I was doing, even though it, they were different from them, that helped to make me stay and stay on track for being successful at school. Um, to maybe make one more observation to your question about what I've been observing, um, we need to it's not wipe the slate clean. We've been doing things well for a lot of years, but it's to, to take some things out for a walk. Some things we've just, we've done them a certain way for a long time, 
and we've never thought, why are we doing them that way? What's the strategy behind them? One of those things is our financial aid. We've never really, or we've not for a long time, had this very specific way, this is what we want to try to do. We want to try to make sure that 50% of our students, you know, uh, that have need, uh, the need is met. That actually is one of the, the prime categories when you look at US News and World Report, um, is, is what is the percentage of need that is done. And I don't think that we have as fine-tuned an approach to that. Um, one of the things that I'm still riding pretty high on, my last five hires have been outstanding hires. Two of them have been here. One is Darren Ellis, and the second one is Don Medley. Don Medley, uh, uh, Darren Ellis is the Associate Provost for Academic Programs and the Vice President for Institutional Effectiveness, and Don Medley is the Associate Vice President for Enrollment Services. Um, she gets it. Um, you're going to be hearing and seeing some things that are going to be changing around that. That, again, contributes to student success. We know that that's a piece of it. That's not everything. That's the other thing is that I'm just not fooled that it's just about the money. It's never just about the money. It's about how you all as faculty interact, lead, and talk to those students and have high expectations of those students as well. That's important. If they don't think that you want them to succeed and are pushing them to succeed, they figure, yeah, cruise. You're supposed to cruise. That's what they expect. That's what I should be doing. We set that kind of tone for our students. And the one-on-one -on -one interactions in the big classrooms, all of that happens there. So, very long answer to one question. Pretty good, using up time, okay? <laughs> Other questions? I have a question. Um, I'm an associate general counsel here at the university in the general counsel's office, and I consult with a variety of people within the university on student affairs issues. And one of the themes that I have seen over the years, over the last eight years of my work, is that the anxiety and stress level among our student population is very high. And people will consult with me because students will care and conduct issues. And so often we see students who are so stressed out, many of them will ask for accommodations for stress and anxiety which they're granted, and so people will consult with me in terms of making sure we don't violate the disability laws. We still treat the conduct rather than the condition, okay? But what, so my question is with that background is, are we considering doing anything to help our students um, in terms of health and wellness, sort of a more holistic approach? Because I know there are various things, I do them for myself. Um, and other than, you know, just ignoring the problem, are there things we're doing that can help our students deal with the stress of academia in today's world, um, especially considering the financial concerns that so many of our students have? And, you know, they're working and going to school. Um, first, I would say that um, I'm glad you said we that we are working, because it is a we. It's part of the reason why you're here, you didn't know the doors are locked. You guys have to come up with all the answers with me and you know we'll just run the university that way, but we run it as a we. Um, and I, I was, when you introduced yourself as, as in working the general counsels, understand it, at my level, you listen to whatever the general counsel is. <laughs> because you're always getting in trouble, and especially me, I'm always saying something I shouldn't be saying. Um, so you're talking about the stress that students are experiencing. This is, it, it doesn't make it, I'm not trying to dismiss it, but this is something that, that students basically across the country are feeling. Um, I used to always get surprised at Duke because here were these students that, you know, went to Europe every year when they were in high school and, you know, they're driving BMWs. I mean, you know, half of them are not on financial aid and they are still feeling stress. And so there are some generalized things that are just going on about being in school, about the achievement. Um, it's, it's connected with social networking. It's connected with lots of things that are going on in our society today. Um, what are we doing about it here? Is David Strauss here by chance? Yeah, there he is. Um, he, if you haven't got a chance to talk to him, I assume that you do. Um, he continues to think about ways in which we can try to work on that. You know, my suggestion has been 
What we need is not to hire more advisors, which we have this incredible army of advisors now that we have, which I think um, for students, if you have not talked to your advisor, you're late. Get and talk to your advisor. I don't care if you walk up to them and tell them what did you have for lunch. Have a conversation with your advisor. But in addition to advisors, maybe we need masseuses. You know, there should just be these tables <laughs> that are out here in front and, you know, student gets stressed, you can come have, you know, a massage. Um, but trying to address some of that stress is important. Actually, I think one of my answers is one of the things I think particularly for our student population that would be useful, and that is, is that we have greater connections through cohorts. Our uh, learning communities, I think, are a great start. From what I've observed, there's a lot of variability to those learning communities. Some of them are, we're calling them communities. A community means that you're interconnected. Some of them are just because you're taking the same class, you're in a room together and you talk about certain things. That does not make a community. That makes a group. We need communities where people are actually sharing and actually working together and understanding that they have a shared mission and that that's the reason why you should be joining those learning communities. And I think even in the ones that are doing it well, we need to try to do it better. That is one approach to be able to try to reduce that stress. Um, to understand that there are, maybe right, sitting right next to you is, is an example of how you actually may solve a problem or even understanding that, you know, yeah, it's $20,000 of debt, but you know, you're gonna have 10 years to pay it off for 40,000 or more. You're gonna hopefully be making more money. To understand um, some of the implications for the decisions that we make, even in terms of trying to navigate and getting through our, our degree programs, that that's one of those things that's that just important to know is how others are doing. Um, one of the things that, that uh, Matt, the director for the OTL, and I are talking about doing um, is creating a Wayne 101. Um, and that's in part to kind of make sure that students know about other students that may have faced the same things that they faced. In addition, trying to help bridge and build some of those basic skills that reduce your stress. If you know how to study, if you know how to take tests, the biggest thing is, is if you know how to manage money. And I come actually back to the financial aid. One of the things that Dawn has talked about doing is trying to make it even more visible about what does it really cost a student to get a degree. So you, maybe you start stressing from day one when you see how much it costs, but you have a realistic expectation and it doesn't come at you every semester something different. You can set a plan in motion and that can help reduce stress. But beyond that, um, part of that is, is the strength that we can have with each other. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I really want to see us be more or let's say less of a commuter style campus and more of campus life. Um, that means that you know, if you have time, if you're a faculty member, spend another hour on campus. Um, students seeing faculty on campus is very encouraging to them. Uh, they look to you for that to be part of what Wayne actually is. And so I encourage you all to do that as students. Uh, I said it during convocation, you know, those of you who are here, you now know me. I, it's so funny, I said that, and now, every now and then when I walk across campus, a student will say, hi, provost, and I'm like, did I meet them? Because <laughs> so, I am terrible with names, I will tell you. I, I can barely remember faces, but I am terrible with names. Um, but to me, that's just so encouraging. And I remember, oh yeah, I said, if you know anybody, you know me. So this is one, know somebody else. Making those interconnections will, will help address that. So, that's, that's at least one thing, but I think that that is an identifiable problem, and I know David thinks about that a lot, about ways in which we can try to try help reduce stress among our students. Is there another question? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question about uh, sort of allocation of resources, in particular, tenure-track faculty hires. Uh, it seems like there are plenty of resources for the IBIO and uh, there are also resources for units that have been relatively poorly managed, like the medical school. Uh, and it seems that the brunt of these the budget cuts that have to uh, reach an equilibrium fall on the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences in terms of hiring lines. So I wonder if you would speak to that. Wayne well, must have put you up to this. <laughs> um, I do not think yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I know Wayne well enough to know, I know how this um, You know, you raise an interesting question. Um, and what I have tried to do, what I will always try to do, is always be, you know, always be respectful of those who came before you. 
Um, so I try not to bash anything, even if I differ in my opinion about how things, decisions were made. So decisions were made and strategies were made before I got here. As you will see with this next year, um, we're going to face budget cuts. Um, I am trying to work with the deans at, at every chance to do a couple of small, small things. Um, one of them is, is in terms of trying to work on faculty equity. Um, there's a lot of that. There, it just depends on the college. Some of them are worse than others. And again, I can't even tell you why. Some, there's probably a different reason depending on whatever college it is. But working on fac faculty equity and then working with some of the colleges that are having enrollment issues um, may seem a bit simplistic. But for me, I want to stop and ask, so what's going right? Don't tell me what's going wrong first. Let's just first figure out what's going right. Okay? So where are your strengths? Where are the things where uh, over time you've been able to invest or someone before you has invested? And those are the things that are really going right so that we can then compare them within college because for every college it's a different issue um, about why things are not working out in those particular things. Sometimes it's been loss of faculty due to retirement, sometimes loss of retention. Um, there's lots of different reasons why. Now how they've been allocated, I'm not going to say it's better. Probably none of the deans will be any happier. I mean, they're looking to say, Keith's going to tell me he's going to give me some more lines. Um, it's, well, it happens for one or two, but not for very many. Um, we don't have that many, and, and my goal is to try to make sure that I try to stabilize things as much as possible because we are in, we're approaching a new budgeting model. Um, that new budgeting model is affectionately called RCM, Resource Centered Management. And there is no pure version of it. It is always modified. But how that will change and how our university is going to change in, let's say, the next three years is that deans, to some degree, will have a little more control over assessing what's going on in their college and making the strategic directions for those colleges. That does not mean that they don't do it without my input. But the way that that management system goes, that there is just a flow of allocation that's a little bit different. It's a little less centralized. Um, we think, um, and one of uh, President Wilson's uh, fairly new hires has been Bill Decatur, our new chief financial officer. Um, he's done this. He's made this conversion at a couple, three different institutions. Um, people are usually a little bit happier. They're never happy because, two, as much as money comes to university, to the colleges, it still has to come back from the colleges and, and to fund some of the things that are operated centrally. Um, but there's a little bit more control over your destiny a uh, little bit more of you get to eat what you kill. Um, so students, beware. Um, but that's one of the small changes that we're going to make. Again, I can't really comment about decisions that were made in the past. But I can tell you that basically every day, um, I have at least one meeting that works on trying to, to look at our budget and to think about it very, very differently. Um, one of the things that I see is a big challenge that we have is that our colleges should have a reserve. They should have a reserve so they can be strategic. Now, how do you go from deficit to thinking that you're going to have a reserve? Um, it means probably in the next couple of years we're going to have to make some very hard decisions that, that you know, <laughs> I'm going to seem like a pitch man. I'm going to promise that they're going to be temporary. But it's to get us to a point where we can actually be much more nimble. But it means that you're going to have to go through some tough times just because of where we are now. Um, again, I'm looking at the deans. For each college, it's a different strategy by which we're going to be able to do that. But that's one of the goals. <laughs> if you guys didn't hear that from me before, now you're hearing it now. That's one of the things we're going to be working on, is trying to figure out a way that we can get to a position so that they actually have not worried about preserving the limited resources they have, but actually how much do they spend down on having at least a small reserve of money to be able to either hire part-time faculty, um, to hire new staff, to start new programs. All of those things actually require money. Um, so that's, that's part of the strategy going forward. I hope that answered your question. Yes, sir. Um, what are your thoughts on how we systematically address the assessment of where you at in all the different equity groups?
I think that that may be a question that I'm the most surprised by, because that's your responsibility. That's Daryl Gardner, who runs our RSP program. Um, <laughs> it's his job. I mean, uh, yeah. um, you know, I think it actually is the hard work that, that you're doing. I think one of the things that I think being an academic programs assessment kind of person, at least in part of my history has been, is that you start looking for what are the best uh, practices learned. And we've been doing a lot of things for the right reasons and not kind of centralizing what's the real success for each one of those. And so that's something that Monica Brockmeyer uh, in my office has been working on. I know she's been talking with you about it. And you know, it's, it's interesting. What I believe will happen, uh, I was told at this meeting that provosts only last four years. That's the average. Um, I'm hoping that I'm better than average. Um, but I do think about horizons and I think about what's gonna happen in five years. That that's my goal and, and what some of the things that have been trends that have been hard to change in the past, if you've got a new idea and a new perspective, it takes time to be able to change. Um, but I think that one of the ways that that's going to change is that we learn from the best practices that we have from some of our very successful programs. From your program, uh, from Mark Jackson's program, we have some programs that I think are doing the right thing. Um, but as I've said to you and I've said to him, and now I want more. I want more cohorts. I, I really do think that um, student belongingness actually is very, very important. And one of the things that I think is so fascinating is that all of us feel a little different. You know, when, when we come to this university, we feel like we're individuals. We can think about how we're different from others. And so sometimes we feel like we're marginalized or we're different from others. We need to make sure that our minority students actually feel as welcome as anybody else should feel at this university and everyone should feel welcome. Um, that comes from having somebody that they know. And actually, um, both Mark and Daryl should be commended on the work that they've been doing because, and actually if you would join me in thanking them. You know, those programs are programs that actually cost the university money. But those are investments that we make that I think are starting to turn around. So part of it is the belongingness, part of it is making sure that uh, we actually need to do this for all of our students. And that is, is kind of doing a better job at assessing them and following them as time goes by. Uh, we have a major initiative out of the provost office that's going on uh, that Darren Ellis and Monica and, and, and Ahmad Isardine are working on, which is EAB, which is going to have us know a little bit more about how students are doing in real time and being able to try to intervene as early as possible, because that's, I think, another thing that happens, uh, particularly for our students who feel marginalized, is that they feel isolated. Um, if something goes wrong, they're more likely to just leave and not ask somebody for help. It's one of the reasons why the programs work with having strong uh, gentlemen as yourself leading that program. They know somebody on campus. Um, we just need to, they need to be larger. And how we do it at scale and how we do it cost effectively, that's the challenge. And I don't have an answer for that yet. Um, but, you know, if there wasn't work to do, I wouldn't have anything to get here at 8 o'clock in the morning for. So, um, but I think that that's, that's what we have to be working on is actually figuring out what's actually working for our students, what are the real challenges for them. Sometimes we watch patterns and we're not asking students exactly what's going on. And you're gonna hear a different story from basically each student that you run into, but I think that there are some general stories that we can actually then build into some of our programs to make sure that they're giving our students the support that they need. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, when thinking about change I didn't hear the very last part. What are your thoughts about student-run organizations? Student-run organizations? Um, that's like the best thing ever. Um, learning to do leadership uh, comes from participating in, in student organizations. I think even actually the presence that I'm hoping that we have more on campus comes from participation with students in uh, the organization, the various organizations that exist on our campus. Um, I don't think that the budgeting is going to change that demonstratively. Um, David Strauss basically prints money, and so uh, there's, there's just never a shortage. Uh, there are hard decisions to be made, and 
you know, one of the things actually that I'd like to see more of that, and this is from a very, very limited sampling, is that I want to see the student groups be better connected with faculty, and not just one faculty, but multiple faculty. They have so much to share with them about the perspective, about how you go about doing things. I came and watched this one particular student group pitch a proposal for a new student group. And, you know, I was so impressed that they, you know, I could see that they actually put together something and were really working towards it. But it, it lacked the polish that having had a seasoned faculty member actually help them with would have made a better presentation. Um, now, I think the student group got approved but I just thought that was a learning, that was a teachable moment to be able to know how you actually, you know, very cohesively, very coherently propose for a student group to be created. And so it's those kinds of missed opportunities that I hope that we can actually turn around. That doesn't cost any money. It costs people's time, but that doesn't cost any money. Let me use that opportunity, too, to make one other point. Um, I will say that um, when I was at Duke, uh, I had, I had a hard job, but I basically had a cushy job. I could, you know, basically come and go as I pleased. I, you know, didn't have that many meetings. Um, and I took on this job, which is not like that. Uh, it's different. Um, but, and some people have asked why. Um, I'm actually still a funded researcher. I still research. I still mentor folks. And people are like, well, wait a minute, you've got a full-time job. How do you do that? And I said, well, helping the next generation of scholars is something that I'm passionate about. Well, Wayne State is something that I'm passionate about. So it's two things that just have to exist together. But I do it because I'm, it, because I'm passionate about it. And when you're passionate about those things, time doesn't, time and money and all those other things take kind of a second seat to actually doing the things that you're passionate about. I encourage particularly our faculty. If you are not doing at least one thing in your life that you're passionate about, you got to make a change. Because what you do and your passion and your excitement starts to get out there in the ether, starts to influence others. And it doesn't just influence the students, it influences your fellow faculty as well. And so I hope from today I'm trying to be very, you know, provostial. Like I said, I'm trying to act like a provost, and so I'm a little calmer than I usually am. For those of you who know me, you know that's true. Um, but I'm passionate about what I do. And I think that that's going to make a difference. That makes a difference in terms of our faculty you know, wanting to get involved in, in student activities. I think lots of students want a faculty member, but from interacting with some faculty, they don't necessarily know the one who's really interested in working with them. You need to make sure that you show your passion and share your passion with others. That's what's going to make us even a better community here at Wayne. One of the many things. That and David Strauss printing money. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Yes. Yes. Have you given thought to how alumni might be able to help you with your priorities? Yes, I have. <laughs> um, I'm a gerontologist. So, and it's so funny because the older you grow, the older, the older you get, the more you think older people are older than you. <laughs> so um, I find it fascinating that I went to something that uh, the Merrill Palmer Institute, um, I told you my connection with Wayne has been through the Institute for Gerontology, particularly Peter Lichtenberg is one of the outstanding leaders of this university. I don't know if anybody ever even really understands what a national leader he is that we have here at Wayne. Um, but he invited me to something that happened with the Merrill Palmer Institute. It was, you know, faculty, uh, uh, some folks who had served and uh, worked with Merrill Palmer in the 50s and 60s. And if you hear what their connection and dedication is to Merrill Palmer and to this university, you know, they could basically pick all of us up and just carry us around. We wouldn't even have to worry about getting lost. They have that kind of commitment to the university. So that is a piece of the plan. Um, if you've heard President Wilson speak, you know, he thinks about this university as an <coughs> urban serving university. Urban serving means that we are connected to our faculty, we are connected to our, excuse me, to our alumni, and we're connected to our community. And it's something that, um, I was mentioning this to, to a group yesterday, and they were saying, you know, well, we have things going on that are connected to the community. 
And that's true. I, I see them all the time. But I don't, I don't think others see them. I don't think that they see the collection of people that are sometimes working. Um, one of my specialty areas is health disparities. And our ability to help health disparities in this city is incredible. And we have a couple of fantastic programs that have been going on. But to me, they have too small of a footprint. There's some kind of way that we need to work better with our community connections and with our alumni to talk about the exciting things that are going on now at the university. And so, yes, that's something that goes on. Um, there's just, there's several different little groups. Um, actually, if Mary's here, she can take a look at my calendar and tell you how many connections, how many meetings I have with alumni. But we're trying to strengthen that. It's, it's one thing that's just, it's fascinating. Actually, so I started on June 1. And on June 1, I went to Mackinac Island and went to the big policy conference. And I went there with Patrick Lindsay in the, in the president's office. And he basically knows everybody who was there, four or 5,000 people. He introduces me to about 600 people. And when I start talking to people who are in Detroit, who are doing programs in Detroit, they go, well, I'd really like to know somebody at Wayne State. And I go, how do you not know somebody at Wayne State? But there is this feeling of separation that we have to break down some of those walls. I think we need to break down some of those walls because part of what an education at Wayne should involve is understanding what it means to be part of a community. Not only a community of students, but also in our local area to be uh, connected with the community. Civic engagement, service learning, whatever you want to call it, ways in which we actually find meaning and find understanding and even have it academically grounded about what it means to serve a community and be connected to a community. That's another piece of what I hope we can develop as we modify our curriculum, to think about ways in which we can understand better that connection. But to answer your question in a long sort of way, notice the provosts do that, you know, you talk long enough and then you run out of time. Um, that, yes, that is something that we need to do a better job on and we are, we're definitely working on that. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I do not share that philosophy, um, and I think I've said it enough times, hopefully, to, to some folks that are, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I was waiting to see uh, Dean Seeger shake his head, yes, um, that um, I, I shared with him, see, we're just, we're such a close-knit group of 150 people, I'm going to tell you these personal things, um, that when I was in high school, I was in a play. I mean. I kind of loved theater. Um, I actually played the piano, too, and my piano teacher was furious with me that I was going to be going to psychology. She thought that I, that was a waste of skills. So, um, and also at the College of Santa Fe, I just lived around people who were artsy and humanities people. Um, so in my education, that's been grounded. Um, I think also I would talk about the experiences and, and the, the uh, efforts that I led in terms of trying to integrate STEM and arts and humanities in an effort that's called STEAM. Um, it's a little colloquialism that's, that's gaining uh, popularity, but it's the idea, um, I think that, and, and I didn't read that piece, but I would hope that they took the perspective of, it is very misguided to think that STEM by itself is actually the way that we're going to make great citizens in our, this country who are, they may get jobs, but they're going to have pieces of their life and pieces of the way that they think and pieces of what they appreciate and how we are going to then, you know, continue to guide our, I don't want to say guide our country to be great again. Um, <laughs> um, and, and I'll give this example. Um, 
And, and I know that this is being videotaped and I just have a feeling I'm going to get a call from some of my colleagues back at Duke. But I'm gonna tell you the truth. So they have been invited to create a campus in Kuchan, China by the, the government of China. Now you might ask, China, this incredible society. I mean, really, arts and humanities are pieces of it that really we could tie to beginning in China. Why in the world would you need an American university there? They very wisely have figured out that they have focused for years on STEM education and pushed it so hard that they pushed liberal arts thinking out. They now understand that that's not enough, that those are not the right creative, innovative, thoughtful people that are gonna preserve culture. And so what they have done in a few instances is invite American universities to come help them create a whole new context where students can learn that has a liberal arts focus to it. It's an example of that we cannot lose our way. Liberal arts is critically important actually to make STEM better. That is my perspective. That thinking that we're going to, it, it's almost making it technical in some ways. Um, but, uh, and I made this, I've made this comparison and people have corrected me on all the other different ways that you could think about it. But I think sometimes of that, you know, we can get this great engineer that can take a round peg and put it in a round hole. But does he know what color it should be? Does he know whether it should have texture? Does he know whether people will really like it or not and Snapchat it? We need those other pieces that arts and humanities and that appreciation actually begin to bring to it. Maybe they need to know the history of what has happened with all of the round pegs and the round holes. Some of them have taken over countries. I don't know. But it really is the idea of being very, very careful not to have that as a piece of a student's education. They need it to be able to be good in a very broad sense of the word citizens who are going to carry on and advance culture. You have to have that piece to it as well. That's at least my thing.